The Cover System is a system for categorizing magic into specific disciplines instituted by Emperor Bellows. There are nine main covens with hundreds of other covens beneath them. The educational system trains young witches along scholarists' tracks that prepare them for membership of their chosen coven. The Owl House Wiki. So, the coven system is a system which divides people into, well, covens instituted by Emperor Bellus. Uh, in his reign, is in his empire of the Boiling Isles. He does this because he has alternative motives with it, which is discovered through work the series. However, that's not really what we're here for. Instead, we're going to take and analyze the common system and find the correlating system in the real world. Because <coughs> at the end of the day, although yes, the Owl House is most certainly just a cartoon, an alternate reality, it is still having systems which are extremely similar, if not identical, to the various systems we have in this real world. Specifically, on the topic of this video, we're going to look at the coven system and the similarities it has with the division of labour. Well, before we can actually get any further into the topic of division of labour and the coven system, we need to have an understanding for what the division of labour even is, because although it is a very big topic and I would argue a very important such, it is usually not very widely spoken of, and when it is, it's only spoken of from one perspective. So, let's take a look at it through another perspective. The division of labour can hold two a bit different meanings. And it is important to declare the differences between these two definitions of the division of labour. So let's start with the first one. In its most narrow and boiled down version, the division of labour can be summarised as a system where tasks and responsibilities are designated to specific roles, either that be for prolonged periods of time or just short periods of time. And that's it. You divide the actual labour to specific roles. However, this is not really that practical of a way of actually analysing the vision of labour in the real world. So let's take a look at the other alternative of a definition. The definition we'll use is a staged division of labour, aka when these roles are held by institutions to keep people in their role and to ensure that these roles do not disappear. A staged division of labour, instead of a temporary division of labour. In other words, there are social systems constituted specifically to keep these division of labour active and staged. An advocate for the division of labour was Adam Smith, someone most people have heard about. Smith hastened to the conclusion that if we have, for example, Smiths who are only working in making the heads or the bottoms of nails, they'll become professionals at that very form of labour and can produce way more than they otherwise could. However, a strong critique of the division of labour would be Pyotr Kropotkin, who declared his opinions and views on the division of labour in his most famous book, The Conquest of Bread. That a smith sentenced for life to the making of heads or nails would lose all interest in his work, would be entirely at the mercy of his employer with his limited handicraft, would be out of work four months out of twelve, and that his wage would decrease when he could be easily replaced by an apprentice, Smith did not think of it when he declared Long live the division of labour. This is the real gold mine that will enrich the nation. And all join in the cry. And later on, when Sismondi or a GB say began began to understand that the division of labour instead of enriching the whole nation only enriches the rich, and that the worker who for life is doomed to making the eighteenth part of a pin grows stupid and sinks into poverty. What did official economists propose? Nothing! 
They did not say to themselves that by a lifelong grind at one and the same machine, Toil the Worker would lose his intelligence as the spirit of inventi invention, and that, on the contrary, a variety of occupations would result in considerably argument augmenting the productivity of a nation. But this is the very issue now before us. Peter Kropotkin. Now, it is indeed true that Peter Kropotkin and Adam Smith are long dead, and the industry and the factories and the whole market have most certainly changed since their lives. However, the very basis of their arguments still hold through. Which bring forth the question, how does the division of labour look in modern time? It is not that Smith has only learned to make the head or the bottoms of a nail anymore, that, that was never really implemented in the way, in the wide scale of things. So is the division of labour even real? Well, as a matter of fact, it most certainly is. Rather than being extremely niche, it's a bit broader, specifically in the form that a broader array of tasks and responsibilities laid on the workers. We have those who work in the division of industry, and although they are capable of quitting their current workplace, they'll find a new factory to work in. Same goes for the scientists, who will find a new topic to research. The teachers who will find a new school to educate in. The retail workers who will find a new store to work in. People are still bound to different divisions of labour. Although yes, we're no longer speaking of only making heads of a nail. The very essence is still there. You are still bounded up into your specific division of labour. And this, you might start to recognise, so it's awfully familiar to how the coven system works. There are institutions who make it incredibly difficult to change your division of labour. A splendid example of this is education. The education system essentially makes you ready to go into one specific field of division of labour. One specific division of the labour mandatory for a functioning society. And if you would then want to change your specific division, you would need to go back to school, it would need to cost you money, and you would not be able to have a stable income, or you would still need to work as a worker while at the same time studying as a student, essentially meaning you would need to burn yourself out, although you're already doing that at your workplace. Another example would be the buyers of our labour power, the employers, who refuse to take in people who do not have enough experience in a very specific set of division of labour. People, the employers, the bourgeoisie, are not interested in employing just about anyone. Instead, they have a very specific institution which keeps people divided up into specific divisions of labour. Sounds perhaps even more familiar now. In the alehouse, you're fo the witches are forced into a coven by getting a sigil on their wrist. These sigils lock them into their specific form of magic, essentially depriving them of being able to do any other form of magic in their religious idea that wild magic or performing multiple forms of magic is dangerous and bad. The Greece will not sign in a sigil on your wrist does the exact same thing. It keeps you specifically locked into a specific division of labour which you are then not very capable of going out of unless you're willing to go in debt and poverty. In the Owl House we see how witches are feeling limited, they're feeling kind of useless and like everything is just monotone but they at the same time think it is for the better. It is for the better that we are limited like this because these shackles are made to protect us. Well that sounds an awful lot like religion, like the state, like capital. But I digress. 
However, these feelings of uh, worthlessness or just pointlessness are things we can most certainly relate to, can we not? We go to work or school only to do the labour which we do on an everyday basis. A bland and monotone eight hour shift only to get back home exhausted watching stupid videos about weird concepts like division of labour and its correlations to the owl house. Although I would like to bring forth a little bit of a less harsh um, section of this video, which would be the coven's real divisions. Because at the end of the day, I most certainly just pottering all of, especially this part, out of my arse, but the covens can symbolise a lot of actual divisions of labour, so let's just walk through that real quick. The abonim abomination coven could be compared to the division of engineering. Abomination magic is focused on creating and utilising the abominations, and a lot of the representation of the abomination magic we get in the show is through the Blight family, a family of engineers. The Bard Coven is rather easy to guess what its real con world counterpart is. It's musicians. The Beastkeeping Coven are for are all from zoologists, veterinarians and animal keepers. It's difficult to just put it into one specific division, but altogether it is about the divisions which focus on taking care of animals. Next would be the Construction co Coven, which speaks for itself. The healing coven is the division of nursing. The illusion coven would most likely be the division of art, with the exception of music. The plant coven is similar to that of the beast keeping coven, branching into several divisions of labour, but which all focus on plants. The potion coven is the pharmaceutical division. The oracle coven is a coven I have difficulties trying to relate to any real world division of labour, which is primarily due to how interconnected it is to the fantasy element of the series. On top of that, we have the Emperor's Cavern, which would be the police and military. We're nearing the end of the video! Congratulations for getting this far, if you have. But let's talk about the heavier stuff again, shall we? Some of you might think, if you are for thinking, Bellows. His entire plan of dividing the witches into covens has been for a massive genocide. The Big G. And that is true. That is indeed a plot. Although, is this really what the division of labour is for in the real world? Well, not really. <laughs> I didn't think that the uh, financial elite, more formerly known as the bourgeoisie, has as a plan to kill all workers with a mass genocide. Of multiple reasons, it is simply just impractical for them. They need us. They wouldn't want to just kill us. That, that's absurdity. They, they need us to produce the labour power that they then just pay us for, and then take our production and make capital out of it. What I am, however, saying is that the vision of labour is a hurtful economic system, both for the individual who gets a very dull and meaningless life, whose intelligence is battered down into essentially nothingness of mundane tasks, but also for the economy, as people are way less proficient and way less effective and way less efficient when they're simply just doing the same maintained task day in and day out. I'm not going to go into a long talk about how a economical system without a rigid division of labour would work, although I do have plans for making a future video about that. So now when we are at the end of the video, I would simply like to say, please, if you have enjoyed this, leave a like and leave a comment. I have done my very best to make something interesting. This is my second try of media analysis, and it is most certainly not perfect. I am aware, thank you. However, it is a try. 
and hopefully it's better than my first one. Bye. I'll see you next time.